Thank you very much, Nate. So, um, recap. Okay, so, uh, so, so far, so, so we have the category of stable maps. <coughs> then we showed that there are certain, uh, then, um, sort of the, the, the subcategory of holomorphic object, of pseudo-holomorphic objects is given by a theta which just associates the weight one to such an object and otherwise zero. And the idea is to deform this theta j into a theta so that a certain number of uh, properties hold. And so we discussed that in the first lecture. Then in the second lecture, we showed actually that there is a smooth structure on this category and explained what that means. And what we would like to find are smooth things which do this. And now, how do we get them? Well, and that is going to start to happen in this lecture, is that we will f define another category lying over it, for which the cauchy riemann for which we have the cauchy riemann operator gives a section functor of this. So the fibers actually will be Hilbert spaces. So over each object, there's a Hilbert space. And the cauchy riemann can be viewed as a section of this. And then the theta will be obtained in such a way for another, object, for another kind of functors, which are this time defined here, which you can view as multi-sections. And I will explain all this. And this, the, so here we already know there are some kind of smooth objects, so smooth functors. There will be also some kind of smooth functors here. And if you choose this thing in general position, satisfying some properties like this, but we have to formalize them for these things, then this one will actually have these properties and will, will be of a good type, namely, uh, it will be of the smooth weighted category type. So locally, it is sort of represented by many folds divided. Uh, yeah, so so it's, it's good enough that you uh, that, uh, that you can actually integrate forms over it and so on and actually can define SFT. But there are some issues, cons uh, there's s something that we just, uh, would have to discuss, namely orientation. And orientations are more, uh, better done to actually go to a covering, where one actually introduces numberings of the punctures and so on. Okay, so that is what we did so far. Um, okay, so this bundle category. So we have our category of stable maps, and we take a functor into Hilbert space. So, so, that, so, so when, when I form, uh, formulate uh, things, uh, I usually give sort of somewhat general formulation, but for, um, for the category of stable maps. So you can think of other categories you put in. Uh, the, the scheme works actually for a lot of theories. So, so we associate to an object a Hilbert space, and in this category, the morphisms, so two different objects might get two different Hilbert spaces, but the uh, morphisms are actually lifted to linear isomorphisms. Yeah? So then you can define a new category, namely it takes the object and the vector which lies over that object yeah, in the Hilbert space. And what are morphisms? Well, it's a pair phi e. Phi is a morphism in your category of stable maps. E belongs to the Hilbert space lying over the, the source of phi. So the source of phi is, say, alpha. And, and what is the target of this morphism? It's just the vector obtained by applying the lift to the original vector e. Is that clear? So, so, you lift, so you lift each morphism as a linear map between the fibers. And the objects are the vectors in this fiber. And the target is the image under this linear map. Yeah, so, so we have. <coughs> it's not blue. <laughs> so I wonder who did that. <laughs> so okay. So I don't want to destroy this piece of art. So. Okay. Ah. 
<laughs> okay, so here we have the object alpha, alpha prime. So here's zero, it's the other zero. There's a morphism phi between these guys. And we have a vector E. And the lift mu of phi is a linear isomorphism, which would map this here to mu phi of E. And this thing here, so we can identify then a morphism for this bundle category with the underlying object and the vector E. Uh, so morphism with phi. And uh, the source of this is E. And the target is the image which you get here. So, so in our, what do we do in our case? Well, if you have such, so that's a building of height one, let's say, then what do we do there? Then this, then here, we have an equivalence class of maps up to R action. So we take a representative. Now, you see, when you take the tangent space here, then because you have the R action here, you can just identify this with R cross the tangent space of the underlying V component of this map. Yeah? You twiddle, has the R component and the, and the V component. And our Hilbert space for, for this object consists of all maps which are complex antilinear from the underlying Riemann surface at the point Z into this thing, which is identified, since I take a representative of here mod R action, but the first factor is independently defined of which thing I take, yeah? And, uh, and this map should have a certain regularity property, namely, it should be away from nodes of the class uh, H2, yeah? And that is because the Cauchy-Riemann section will act on H3 stuff, and it goes down to H2. And at the punctures, you have to also take you take exponential decay of this thing. So if you, if you take a puncture and you take cylindrical co holomorphic coordinates, you want exponential de uh, decay of the derivatives, up, partial derivatives up to order two, which is precisely when you take this uh, stable maps, which are asymptotic to cylinders and go uh, have quality three delta zero, so three times pa three partial de uh, derivatives with exponential decay. And then if you apply the Cauchy-Riemann operator, they would go to two derivatives with the same decay. Yeah, so that, that is what you take. So that's the Hilbert space. And more generally, if you have a building, then over each of those, so, this, so you have alpha zero up to alpha n, over each of them you take such a thing. <coughs> it's clear then how this acts, namely, if you have a zero of one form, you just take T uh, So then the, these morphisms come from biholomorphic maps between the buildings, and you, you, you map uh, E to what is it, T, T phi inverse or something like this. Yeah, E composed with E composed with T phi inverse, the tangent map of the biholomorphic map inverse. Can I ask a question for this slide? Huh? So um, you said that you wanted a bundle of Hilbert spaces, but has not been given yet. But come. So, so, so let me for the, uh, so, so in this, so in my talk, so I, I first did the underlying space just as, as a category without smooth structure. Then we looked at all the relationships. Then I put a smooth structure on it, could say more about it. Now I put just an algebraic structure on this, discuss that, and then I put a smooth structure on these two things. And at that point, you are on the level where you can just, uh, unleash some abstract perturbation results, which brings things in general position. Yeah, so that's sort of the structure of the talks. So here, uh, we inherit a lot of the structures which comes from the uh, stable maps. So we had this input out, this evaluation maps, uh, functors E, 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 e uh, V plus minus. Well, we just compose it with this, uh, well, with this projection down here, and then we get such an evaluation map for E. A grading, the grading we take from uh, the underlying object. 
then we can decompose this. And that is actually as before, except that this thing now has a little bit more structure yeah, over each object. I mean, so it has a structure uh, over each object. Our original objects, there lies a Hilbert space. And the next thing is to lift the data from S to E. Yeah? And the data from S to E means, in particular, the covering business which we had. So how does it look like? Actually, rather trivial. So in the base, we have this chopping functor. And then you just, over each of these parts, you have the 0, 1 form, and you just put it forward. That's it. And it's, it's linear. It's, it's fiber-wise a linear isomorphism. Yeah? So I have these objects, which is a building. And over each of these floors, I have a 0, 1 form. And I chop it here, and I just take that forward. And that is an isomorphism on the fibers. So it then satisfies precisely the relationships which we had. So that's, that's basically completely on the nose, so you don't even have to think about it. And then there's a functor. Maybe if alpha is given, which consists out of the different buildings, you just, for each map on each building, coming from each building, you just apply the Kutcher Riemann. So that's a functor. And so let's now think of, uh, you might have noticed, it looks really rather, rather like this, but <laughs> the color is better. Uh, that is Joe's color, yeah? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of better than that one. <laughs> okay, no, let's not elaborate on this any further. <laughs> so. So, so now let's first algebraically discuss um, what we can do here. So, so, the, so the, the idea is to perturb theta j. And theta j it limits my options here. But, uh, so. If I put a pseudo-holomorphic object into this, then this vanishes, and this thing gives, uh, gives to the zero vector weight one and otherwise zero. So, so then that's precisely this one. So, so then we want to perturb this, and what we see here, this gives just the weight one for the zero section. So the idea is now, say, if, if this is a zero section locally, I want to sort of have a partition of unity of this, and just move. So I view the zero section as several zero sections, but with rational weight. And then I move this individual parts away to achieve transversality. That is what, what you ultimately want to do. Yeah? So that's, that's the idea. Of course, then you run it. So, so this one will be perturbed, let's say. But, but when you move this away, you want to keep the symmetries. It should stay a functor. Yeah, for example, locally, you have the action of the automorphism group. This whole thing which you get, so, so it might be. So this will be turned into something like this. If this is a, if this is a zero section, so here's a, here's, a, here's a base, S, and here's sort of E. Yeah? It would sort of look like this. And you want to turn it into this. But, you want that this whole stuff, these things each have a fractional weight. Yeah? You want to, to want that this is invariant. Then, of course, you do this at different places, so, so it becomes a little bit more messy. So if you go globally, so then, then the things which are constructed might be then bifurcate further off, and so on. So, so that is what you want to do. So you need to develop sort of a machinery to be able to pick such things which sort of, so these are, these are, so you see, if lambda zero is replaced by some lambda which consists out of this section, then this is only positive if the kosher riemann operator perturbed by such a section set is, is zero. Yeah, what does it mean? If, if this is a graph of, if this puts the weight on a graph of different sections, 
then this here will only, if I perturb this, only become positive if, if you solve cauchy riemann of alpha equals one of the things in the graph. And this you want to achieve transversally. And if this is transversal, then that actually will be a smooth object, yeah? a smooth functor. OK, so that's sort of the idea. And for this, then you have to develop a little bit of machinery. So is that clear, sort of, what the aim is? You are the chair, you are not asking questions. Oh, okay, you're good. It's like the, the most basic possible question I should ask before. What would happen if your perturbations were not functors? Well, then you lose some symmetry, and I think there's still a theory, but it's not the theory we want to do. Okay. I, th I, think, I think you can actually do some brutal, some really brutal stuff and ignore some, some of, of the structures that you can do, and uh, you know, if. That's another, that's another way to produce data. And then out of this, presumably, you can produce some invariants. If they're interesting, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you do S1 invariant MOS theory, then you just forget the fact that it's S1 invariant, and, and then you have usual MOS theory, yeah? something like that. So it's on that level. But if you work locally, um then what, what the functor is doing is really saying you choose something locally and then it's consistent with something else you choose to show them somewhere else locally. So they yeah, so, so, yeah, but, yeah, it's, you, yeah, so you have to keep that, but, uh, but you might not, so in some sense when you patch it together you want that it fits, but you might maybe, yeah, so, well. It could fit in some slightly it complicated could, way. It could, could, could be, yeah, so you have to think about, you have to think about it because, just saying, now oh, this should fit with that is easier to say with a whole lot of structure which we have than actually saying I relax it somewhat locally. Like I could say it should not be invariant under, under the as, uh, as action of the isotropy group and then say it can match it up globally. Because, because the constructions are local, so you, so you write, as we'll see, a, a perturbation as a sum of a lot of perturbations and you construct them locally and then you have to transport them all over the place by the morphisms. Yeah? The local construction, well, but uh, but it, it, but I think it's it's possible, at least in, in a general framework. To if you have a criterion to um, forget some of the structure. For example, you could definitely forget the structure that you want to um, when you perturb that if you add trivial cylinders to it, that they should just appear as pseudo holomorphic cylinders. You could use them in your perturbation. So that would stay consistent as long as it's invariant under morphisms. You could also disregard the fact that things are disjoint unions. I mean, if you have disjoint unions, that if this is a solution to this, you could also go away from this. However, I don't think for the latter one you would get a new, a new theory, because since you can do it, there's at least a cobordism from, <laughs> from not doing it to the one doing it. And then I think when you arrange the data, you might actually get just a lot of cancellations. But I, but I haven't, haven't carried this out. So there, there are a lot of things you can think about. Yeah? So, OK. OK, so, so what are the requirements on lambda guaranteeing the desired properties for theta? And um, here they are. Actually, they are, they are even better to formalize than for, for theta. So, so first of all, we have to define something on the fiber product. So if this, on the fiber product things, so I, I, I ignore, I don't write down that E zero lies over alpha zero. Yeah? So then you just take the product of the things. You don't want any zero in the way? Zero? zero. One should be zero. Oh, uh, yeah, so uh, yes, I want, <laughs> thank, thank, yes, I want everything. So this, uh, I don't know, was my keyboard, I guess. I uh, tapped the wrong button. Yeah, so this is a zero, sorry. Okay, so this is a restriction. Then we have this covering functor. So, um, um, in the f so here's the algebraic version of this, which corresponds to the version in the first lecture. But these things can be also lined up according to the f underlying phases you have, yeah, which was sort of lecture part two with a lot of confusion, which hopefully decreased in the discussion session, so, which would be the same formula. Uh, but, so this is the algebraic version here. Yeah. So is, is the right-hand side not equal to 
just taking this maximum breaking of any one object. Right, but uh, yes, if if you have this property, yeah. So, I mean, if if you, I mean, this, this is okay. So what what this what this what this says is basically. So it's you know maybe I should never write this formula, but. So what it says is... I mean, I guess mainly, mainly I'm asking, is there some interesting sign that I need to be aware of? No, it's just a lot of constellations. So ultimately, there's one term, if you have this... I mean, if, let's say lambda is always plus one or minus one. The result here is always going to be yeah, yeah. plus one or yeah. zero. Mm -hmm. So now here, that, that, uh, that is now important. So if I have an object alpha, then it has the associated Riemann surface. And then the Riemann surface can be decomposed as the component. So, so let's first think a building of height one. The, the parts of the surface which carry the things which are non, not trivial cylinders and the things which carry trivial cylinders. Yeah? And if you have a building, a trivial cylinder building is just a line of those guys. And so when you look at this thing, you can see the trivial cylinder buildings and the rest of the components. Yeah? So, that, so that's a natural decomposition. And you have a forgetful functor, namely, it forgets the trivial cylinder buildings. OK, we had that already. So now, now there is, first of all, a Wittner type decomposition of E. So if I look at my Hilbert space, and have a 0, 1 form about, uh, over it, I can, f I can put this thing 0, 0 on the trivial cylinder building, over the trivial cylinder building, or I can put it 0 on the, on the, comp on, on the complement. So this here is the part which, which is defined on the original building, but it is 0 over the trivial cylinder component, and this one is perhaps non-zero over the trivial cylinder component, but it's zero on, the, on its complement. So you have this decomposition. Yeah, so here, here it's written. And I have a question. Yeah. So if you have a two-level building, and on the bottom, and if you have a two-level building, and uh, it has no trivial buildings in it, uh, so it's non-trivial on, on, on every level, and suppose on the, on the bottom level you have a trivial cylinder and something non-trivial, then what's the corresponding splitting? Is, it, is, is ETC just restricted <laughs> to trivial cylinder buildings or restricted off? Triv trivial, trivial, uh, it, it would be here trivial cylinder buildings. So, so if I have something, and then what you said, say, I, I have some non-trivial cylinder here and have a trivial cylinder there. And then I have <coughs> this, which is trivial cylinder. So it would put, so, so I have a zero one form over this. It would, so the ENTC would just put the value here zero. Okay, not on the not, not here. Okay. But, but it turns out when you do your inductive steps for actually constructing lambda, then this bit already appeared earlier, and then that the thing was already having required properties here to begin with. And the trivial cylinder is something which is in a sort of zero, it's homotopic to something. To, to a geoholomorphic cylinder, yeah. So here is a picture, so so I would, so, so here is a lift, so here is a lift of the little c, it just forgets the underlying trivial cylinder building and just restricts uh, and gets this new object uh, here in E, yeah? So before you just for, forgot about part of the stable map, now you throw away part of your, your object in E. So, so now you have two functors, so one is Pi, pi is just the projection here of this Wittner decomposition on, on uh, E, uh, on this. So, it, so in particular, it preserves the underlying, it, it covers the identity on objects. But, th but this one, C, does not cover the identity. It covers the forgetful functor below where you actually throw away trivial, trivial cylinder components. Yeah? 
Okay. Why are we having such a careful discussion of the trivial cylindrical rings? Because of, uh, if you want to SFT or want to, to, okay, so if you think of this here as a preparation of, of producing ultimately data by integrating forms over components and so on, then when you, the, and then the next step is what can I do with the data? Can I represent it as a chain complex or something like this? Then if you want this thing to have certain properties, and in this case, an algebra property, you have, to, you, have to, you have the discussion of the cylinders. They look, of course, completely trivial, but since you make concatenation, then you, have, you add something into it and so on. So, so they play actually a non-trivial role. Yeah, so that is why, because, so if, if you would disregard them in some way, well, let's presume you also some theory, but it would be different. Or possibly different. So, so now this is, of course, a projection here. And here, if, if the underlying object doesn't have trivial cylinder components, then actually you have this identity, obviously, yeah? because there's nothing to, f to put zero. Okay, all this, fu this functor, so this, uh, this, is a con uh, this is also a, a retraction, yeah, it's linear on the fibers, it covers the other retraction, so that's sort of the, the structure which we have. And, and uh, this thing's commute in this way. And, and then what is important is that if you restrict C to the non-trivial cylinder part, you get actually fiberwise and isomorphism. That's actually important when I, that, that allows me to pull back perturbations by this because I have the linear, linearity in the fiber, I mean, isomorphism in the fiber. So, so if you go through this list of things here, you find that it's actually rather trivial in the concrete example. But, but this kind of things, how I write it, is actually in all the problems, like Fleur theory and so on. So it's just always this kind of, of structure. Okay, requirements. So, so there's this pullback operation. And here, so, so what, do, what does that say? So lambda e should satisfy this. So if lambda e is positive, that has to be this. So if this is positive, this has to be 1. And what does that mean this is 1? This means that over the trivial cylinder part, the component of E is zero. What that means is I actually don't perturb over trivial cylinders. Yeah? So if you think about, if you don't perturb over trivial cylinders, that means then D bar over trivial cylinder is zero, which means it's actually a pseudo-holomorphic cylinder. Yeah? I don't have to perturb there. Is that, is that clear? So, if lambda e is positive, here I have lambda e, lambda e here, then this one has to be 1. So this here is a part of e over a trivial cylinder building, and lambda 0 is our original thing, which puts weight 1 on the 0 section and uh, otherwise 0. So if this is 1, this means this is a 0 vector, and that means there's no co the e over a trivial cylinder component is 0. Yeah. So then the d bar part on this, if d bar is equal to that e over a trivial cylinder, it's a pseudo-holomorphic cylinder. So that, that you see how it already produces one of the properties of our theta. Yeah. So going back to the picture, the, the, for the cylinder that's in the middle of the bottom level, can that be perturbed? No, because of the inductive nature of things. So. So at some, uh, on some levels, like a level one building, of course, that is something I'm, uh, which would satisfy this property. So whatever you construct in the perturbation because of this algorithm, it, it will actually not perturb over, over trivial cylinders. So you would always get pseudo-holomorphic cylinders out after the perturbation. So then, then, of course, there's sort of what we had before if I have two stable buildings and then I, and I put them together, I, I, I can move them against each other, then you want that property here. If I take one of the representatives. So now, so what does it now mean if this is, let's just discuss what, what, what does it mean if, if this is positive on an object? So first of all, it means there exists a rational number sigma positive 
a vector in the fiber over that object, so that lambda of E is E, and alpha satisfies this equation here with a weight sigma. Yeah, sigma is the number associated to this object alpha. So now, if, if alpha is actually a building uh, of height k plus 1, so top floor has k, then the sigma can be written as a product of positive rational numbers. And each of the alpha i, set it, and this e then, of course, is a sequence from e0 to ek, and each of those satisfies this equation with a weight sigma i. What do you mean by with a weight sigma i? Yeah, so, uh, if, I, so if you look at, so how, what is the interpretation of <coughs> lambda composed with, so it means, since in the fiber I have different vectors, that it satisfies one of the equations coming from the, non, from the vectors with non-zero weight, and they have a weight coming from the underlying alpha. And so I get a sequence of equations, and each of them carries a weight, and if I add the weights all up, it's one. That's precisely the splitting of the zero section. But the equation itself doesn't depend on the weight. It's no, no, the, the no, 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 yes. So, so ultimately, in some sense, we count solutions, but we don't count them zero, one, we just count them with a rational weight. Yeah. Yeah? And of course, there might be a sign also. But, but this contributes, so, so if I have two solutions with each topologically counting one, and the equation has weight one half, then the total thing I see is one. One half for that equation plus one half from the other. Yeah? So it's a system of equations where if the equation is true and you have a solution, you just, it contributes according to its weight. Yeah? It's like the S&P index, yeah? how big is the capitalization of a company, or something like this. Yeah? <laughs> For those who are interested in buying stocks, I mean, it's sort of this kind of... But well, you're also going to say that you cap lambda of E equals sigma, that's what that... Cap lambda of E, yes. So, so this is, of course, what happens here, that, which I said somewhere here, lambda of E is sigma. Okay, there it is. Yeah, here it is. So that means if I solve the equation d bar equals e, this equation counts and it's taken into the general bookkeeping with the weight sigma. Yeah? So, so then this one here, uh, if, if there's a length, is decomposed in, in a certain number of eis, and we have this product structure. Yeah? And so each equation is this here has this weight. Then I can put this together to this one, and the sigma comes from this individual weights of these parts. So then, because of this, this property here, each EI vanishes on the trivial cylinder components, actually, actually on every I, because this one was already perturbed in this EI. Yeah? So this is, this is a, a building of height one. And this EI already satisfies the property that over a trivial cylinder component is zero. Yeah? So, so, the, so all the trivial cylinder bits, for example, this one here, if you look at the blackboard, all over this, if there are solutions, would actually be real J holomorphic cylinders. So then, if the alpha i has different components, so on, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a so, so I'm looking on a, on a floor, then this, then this components, you can decompose it according to the different components, and some of them have trivial cylinders in it. And each of them actually has a weight, and the sigma i would be a product of the weights for the individual components. So this is what the perturbation all, all does. Yeah? So individual components are perturbed separately, pseudo-holomorphic, uh, trivial cylinders turn out to be pseudo-holomorphic, and so on and so on. So it's, so now we come to the smooth, so, so algebraically I think now it's sort of clear and now we have to put a smooth structure on this thing and see that we can do, define what is a smooth lambda and so on and then uh, we are ready for the perturbations here. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So like, just about what's going on. So at the end, at the very end, you end up with something which is a Q linear combination of manifolds or something which is only locally a combination of manifolds, whatever that means. No, that may, yeah, okay, so, so, modulo the following is actually one of the things you said, so, <laughs> which, which I'm explaining now. So, 
if I have two manifolds, weight of each is one half. I could view them as four manifolds by taking a copy of each of them with weight one quarter. That would be considered equivalent. So then you can, so then in the, uh, then if you have overlaps, so you have here some manifolds and here some manifolds with weight, what does it mean they fit together? Basically, it means that if you take a certain number of copies here and a certain number of copies here, you can match them up so that the weights are the same. So they smoothly sort of fit, fit together. So that's... Which one of the things which I said was correct? Well, I don't... The, uh, I think the second one... But it's, it's not a... It's, it's in the middle. No, but you can't break it up into manifolds and then give each of them a weight because they, they yeah. maybe... There's, there's no natural identification, you just can identify after uh, cutting. Okay. Locally, you can do that. But, but not globally. Not globally. No. I mean, you can put some artificial structure on it to say what you have to do at any given moment in the overlaps. I mean, you, you can say, you put the structure on top and says, you have to take so many copies, and that you have to identify with this one. So. Which is actually, uh, you have to do when you do extension prop uh, uh, when you do extension properties like for sections. I mean it's the same thing for sections, because when you look at how if I have a section defined over the boundary, how do I extend it to the interior? Well, the only method is you make a local extension, take a partition of unity. But but if I don't know what to identify with what, what do I add actually up then? Yeah. So you need that structure of this identification, extend, and then. According to this identification, you glue the things together to get an extension near the boundary. So. Thank you. Good question. Any more? Okay. So, so now the theorem is there exists a natural here. Star means uh, up to some fixing some discrete set of data, a strong bundle structure for this thing here. So it is pre basically like the polyfold structure for this except that we here have a strong bundle lying over O. We have the associated translation group part. Yeah? So the objects fibering, so, so, over e, so the objects on top are um, vectors in, in a strong bundle over E. Then we have an action by the uh, isotropy group on this. And here it covers this thing. This, this, comes, this is one of the psi's from the polyfold structure on S. And we have this in a coherent way. And then if you have two of those guys, then we get the transition set. And that transition set is actually bundled over the transition set here. And this has a strong bundle structure, as it was defined in one of the lectures uh, last week. So, so this would be sort of the generalization of the structure which we had here. And at this point, you can start talking about smooth multi-section functors. Is that sort of clear? OK, so, so now it takes a Cauchy-Riemann functor, and it goes from here to here. And actually, well, just look at this composition here. Then it lies in the image of this one. And you get a local representative. And it turns out it's SC Freton, but which was defined by Katrin and Joe. And the model like category, so that is uh, where this is zero, has a property that uh, its orbit space intersected with each connected component in the underlying space, Z is the, uh, the orbit space of this, is compact. That's gamma of compactness. Yeah. So, so now we are in, 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 a, in a smooth setting. The so Cauchy-Riemann section is, is a, an SC smooth section. That's a diff, that is what that property means, yeah, that this is Freton. Then uh, if, if this, this thing vanishes, this means we have pseudo-holomorphic objects, which is sort of this, say, associated model-like category to this one. If I take its isomorphism classes and intersect it with, with a connected component, of the orbit space, it's compact, that, that's gram of compactness. So that's by definition what it means as uh, you have a Fretholm functor. I, I've just forgotten what O and S. Ah, O and S. So S stable maps, good. That is what we're talking about for a while now. <laughs> good, good. Then O, uh, th this functor is defined the polyfold structure. So these are 
Um, in inject, these are the things which are in, in, injective of, on objects. Uh, if you pass to orbit space, uh, you get. Uh, so there's a point here, an object here, which is mapped to the original given object alpha, and so on. But O is a retract. Uh, yeah, O, o well, it's a, you just take an M polyfold. M -polyfold. Uh, it's an M polyfold. So then this is a strong bundle over an M polyfold that was also introduced. So that is a model for. Oh, so is, is the statement that if I. So E over S is some bundle that we already started that way. It's a statement that whenever you pull back to a polyfold bundle, to a polyfold chart, like a strong polyfold bundle, is that what it means? Yeah, so that means that given any object here, there's a selection of a set of those guys. And if you put that in, then uh, that sort of is sort of the local structure near the object alpha. Let me try this again. So is, is del bar, yes. phi bar defined by pullback? Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in this case, then, for, for this construction which you have, if you take any of those guys, uh, uh, it is a Fretholm operator in the sense as we have discussed. So the picture is here. When I described before, you have the smooth functor theta, and I put my hand in, then I see sort of manifolds. Now I have a bundle over this lying here. And when I see the cauchy riemann functor, the trace, what it does here, and where it's mapped to, that's actually a real Fretum operator. And, and that I can put anywhere. And, and, and this structure gives, if I know something here, I can always transport it to, to, the, to a neighborhood of any isomorphic object. <coughs> so that's, that is what it, what it means. So now here's the polyfold packaging of the SFT data. So we have a strong bundle structure of our polyfold. The cauchy riemann section functor is SC smooth and Fritholm. We have SC smooth covering functors with compatibility and some additional stuff where we have for each phase. So we, I haven't defined this, but it's off clear. We, we defined it for on, uh, on the level for S. Yeah, so if I phase here, then this here is just the stuff of E lying over S theta. Then this was the covering functors. Then there were a certain number of compatibility conditions, which we discussed in the last lecture and also yesterday in the discussion. So you have these diagrams of these things, and you have that. So I, 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 oppress, uh, I suppressed here uh, the moving of, um, uh, of, of components against e each other. Then, um, then out of this data, then one can uh, write down, which we did before, a requirement for the perturbation you want to do. But, but that is basically sort of the smooth packaging of, of the data which you need to do, to produce the data which you need for SFT. Yeah? The last diagram also is commutative if you replace P by Z bar, right? Uh, all these functors commute. No, I mean, if you, like, in the first two, you, you what? Uh, which you talk about this or this or this, this? So there are three diagrams, right? Yeah, okay. And then there's two equations <coughs> below that which I read as if you change the arrows down and label them P to arrows up and label them D bar. Yeah, 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 here, so, so it's compatible. So if you put the sections, if you put the Koshirima section here, the local representative, uh, so here this is, in, so this is a restriction, this is a restriction of the Koshirima and, and here the other one, yeah. Everybody is asking why are there not three equalities at the bottom, three diagrams? Uh, Okay, so so yeah, so that's good because I forgot to write them. So so if you apply if you apply uh, yeah, so what do I want to say? Yeah, well, this this more controls this one. So uh, if I you see here here's the identity. So there's not too much happening with respect to the bar. So which is controlled by the C, but the C has certain properties with respect to the P. I mean, that's what you want to say here if you have. But it is true that if P composed with D bar is simply mm -hmm. zero, probably. Uh, I, identi no, no, no. If you have a solution, on the, on the solution set, what you're interested in is identity minus pi composed with D bar would be zero, which means on the trivial cylinders, you would, would be pseudo-holomorphic. Yeah? Identity minus pi composed with D bar equals zero means on the trivial cylinders you are pseudo holomorphic. Right, so that's exactly the, the equation here, right? So pi composed with d bar is in fact equal to d bar. Uh, uh, it would be... 
Well, you might have a non-trivial cylinder which is not homomorphic in S. You are, no, you are allowed allowed. a trivial non-homomorphic cylinder in S. And then the other part of that would not be zero. No, then it would not be zero. No, I, I just said only on the solution set ultimately. Right, so, so, I think so, I think you can't, I mean, you can write certain things under the dish, under the sum. So, identity minus pi d bar equals zero, provided the, the, uh, well, provided actually uh, the, what does it actually mean? Equals zero means, well, that is precisely what you can say. Identity minus pi composed with d bar equals zero precisely means the, uh, the, the, the trivial cylinders which you see are pseudo-holomorphic. Right, but that is exactly your right-hand diagram commuting. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Now, okay, so something in that direction. So let's, so let's put a weight on this uh, 0 0.1, and uh, so there's some tr truthiness to it. <laughs> okay. So now, constructions of SC plus multi-section functors, which are a particular class of those guys here. So, so this is an important class. It's sort of, these are multi-section functors which you can sort of view as multi-sections of, these are sort of compact perturbations of this. So, so multi-section functor is of that particular kind, provided it has the following properties. So if you take, if you take sort of this uh, uniformizers, and the underlying thing, the Q0 would be the object where, where, where you're looking at, then this composition here is a, a, a count of the number of indices for, this, for having the number of indices where this H satisfies this. So, so you go into the base, yeah, pH, so H lies in so H lies in K, yeah, PH lies in O. The, these things are defined on O, and if SI of the underlying base point is equal to the vector you put in. You count the number of indices, yeah, this is that, and divide by the number of indices you had. And these things here should be local SC plus sections, and let me remind you what that was. This strong, this strong bundle come with a double filtration. Namely, it made sense to talk about M, K, and here M, where, uh, where K is less or equals zero, less or equals M plus one. So in particular, you have a K, uh, you have a K zero one lying over an O zero, and the SC plus sections are actually going from here to here, and lie in the fiber over M in M comma M plus one. Yeah? So, so the SIs, so the SIs go from, so they are defined on O zero, but they go into K M M plus one. And then, of course, what is important, that is why I said it's compact, if you go, this is a fiber regularity, and if you view them with respect to the different norm, that is a compact inclusion. That is why I call it this compact perturbation. So these are some kind of sections, but they are uh, constrained by having this property. And there were, I think you, you talked about that, or it was mentioned maybe uh, last week. I don't understand what the definition is saying. It's saying that there exist SIs? Yes, so there exist finally many SIs, so indexed by the set I. And you look at the coincidences. So basically, the picture here is, if this, if this is O here, and this is a fiber, then locally, so you have a certain number as i's, i and i, and, and each of them carries the weight one over i, uh, one over the number of elements in this thing. Yeah? And you just look at this vector here, how often, on many, uh, how many graphs are there in which it lies? Yeah, so you have this vector, so psi, this is an E here. Hmm? We have definition of multi-section function before. Right? And the only difference now is that we require the things that we locally represent it by the SC plus. That's right, so locally in, in a chart yeah, or a uniformizer, uh, so, so first of all, the multi-section functors were in each fiber, there were a finite number of vectors with, which having weights adding up to one. 
So now, if I put the chart in, then I have this, of course, on the image, but they should allow, but this different thing should lie on, the, on graphs of an SC plus section. Is that clear? Yeah, so, so if you put your hand in, and you see in the fiber, the different points, they line up as lying on a graph of SC plus sections. So now we want to, and, and, and this section should be sort of compatible with the group action, and that's sort of the compatibility. So, so there is an action of our automorphism group on the set I, and you have the orbits under the conjugation by this thing lying in there. So let me first say certain properties, what you can do with these guys. So you can build this sum here, which is sort of a convolution. And this is smooth. So if each of those guys is an SC smooth, or SC plus, so I forgot the plus here. So if this is SC plus, then this is SC plus. Because what is the representation, what is the local section structure of this thing? You just have the section structure SI for one and TI for the other, TJ for the other, and you just take all possible additive things and just take as a weight, uh, uh, as a way to take one over the number of the indices here times the indices of the other. So you only have lambda 1 and lambda 2 sitting on different bundles? No, no, they are there for on our bundle E. So why do you call this a sum and not product? Well, it's a convolution. That's better because on the section structure, you take basically all possible things how you can add up things. So, so if, if locally, so if locally, uh, the first one is given by SI and the other by SI prime prime and this in index set I, index set I prime, then the sum is given locally by taking all these combinations here. But, with, with the, but where, the, where the index set is actually I cross I prime. Yeah? So plus because of that. Huh? So, so then this one here, well, just uh, replaces the sections locally by t times the section. Yeah, so, so of course, so it's one over t on the other side, otherwise, so this is a smooth family. So this is okay. So if t is zero, you just get uh, lambda zero, so I put the lambda, the zero up here. Otherwise this. What is lambda zero? Oh, uh, so it should be the zero should be up here. It's it's a, it's a, it's a section <coughs> which uh, just is a weight one on the zero section. I mean, this is a smooth procedure. So if so so this one here, what does that mean? The indicator function here it just means that the local structure is t times si. And then if t goes to zero, then you get the zero section. So lambda zero of e is zero unless e is Zero, in which case it's one. Yeah. And here. And that oh, that works exactly because the total sum of weights over any on any yeah. fiber is one. Is one. Yeah. So that is actually a smooth family if you change t. So then, if you have a, if you have an SC smooth functor into R, yeah. So it's clear what that means. That means if you compose it with a uniformizer, it's SC smooth then you can put that in front of it here. So you can use partitions of unity to cut off such multi-sections smoothly. Then this makes sense as long as locally, uh, near, near a point in a uniformizer, you just have that the family is locally finite. So if you take a point, and then you, you have only finitely many non-zero vectors there and you just add them all up in this way. So then this is also, again, a good section. So, so, so these are important facts for actually constructing perturbations. This allows you to construct things locally and then just add things up. Uh, and then a good fact is if, if, I, if I give you any, so it should be smooth, I see, I don't know, a smooth object, and a smooth vector, then there exists actually such a lambda of or SC plus multi-section functor where lambda of E is positive. So I, I'm going to show you this, how to prove this. So, so now, for example, locally, remember uh, when Katrin was describing 
the transversality result uh, and perturbation result. So, how, so if, I, if you have a fret home, or even in finite dimensions, if you have a section of a vector bundle and you want to make it transversal by a small perturbation, what you take is you add to it some ti times the perturbation to fill up the co-kernel. Then you solve this with respect to the additional parameter, you get a manifold, and then you project onto the parameters you added and you take a regular value. And for every regular value, that is a good perturbation. So now, what do we have locally? Locally, we, so what we want to achieve locally is we want to break the symmetry. That is generally what we have to do to, to achieve transversality. Of course, sometimes we can avoid this. Then we take the orbit of this perturbation, which is also transversal. And then we have maybe some more perturbations. But for each of these problems, it's precisely that argument. So when you look at this, you just have to make sure that one of the local problems is transversal. You get a set of full measure for the perturbation. You take intersection, and then you take some of the values there. So, so that's the only additional complication. But otherwise, you use precisely this thing. So what that means is that actually, rather than talking, uh, taking local sections, you construct local multi-sections and take that sum. And each local multi-section depends on a few real parameters t. You take the direct sum so that it fills up the co-kernel. And then among all this, then you get sort of this branched manifold. And then you have a projection on t. And then for each piece of manifold, you require that that projection is regular. Now, these are countable conditions. And so you find uh, regular things. So that's the, that's the only <coughs> difference. So it's, it's a straightforward thing from, coming from there. Uh, then you can even go further. Um, for example, when you, uh, when you have a boundary point and the kernel lies a little bit stupid with respect to the boundary, like it's, ta it's, it's tangential to the boundary, then you could, uh, it, it, then if you introduce multi sections who have a particular linearization, you can actually tilt the kernel into the manifold to make it transversal. So, but that is also a little bit, so for this you only have to construct a section which takes enough values to fill up the co-kernel. Here you have to think about that it has a specific, it might have, say, value zero there, but it should have a particular derivative which together with the linearized cauchy operator has a certain thing. So, but that's the same problem like in finite dimensions. So, so there's no, nothing new. I mean, it's of course not so surprising because Fretham theory is locally a finite dimensional problem times something you don't have to care about. Yeah? And for that finite dimensional thing, these perturbations are as rich as in the finite dimension theory. OK. So, so let me just explain you how I construct a section. So, so, I, so I want to construct at alpha in the neighborhood. In, in a, so I want to construct a section which has a certain property at, at an object alpha. Didn't you just explain to us how you construct a section? So now I do it. So, uh, no, uh, no. Let me. Let, I const you know, well, on some level. Now I give you on a precise level, and still I have s ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Five. Okay. Good. So, you know, you just have to put something on the table, and then you get a good answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so I t so I so I want to construct something uh, at the smooth object alpha with a, with a given smooth vector over it. So what do I do? So I take such a uniformizer. So here's a picture. The underlying thing. So this is an orbit space that would be psi. The image of this one, if I pass to orbit space, would be this red stuff. So. There's a point somewhere here which corresponds to the object. I take a neighborhood U there. So now, now I const so now what, what do I need? So in Hilbert spaces, you always have smooth bump functions, but on certain uh, Banach manifolds as well, but unfortunately on certain Banach manifolds or Banach spaces where you don't. So I think C alpha, I think, does not have smooth bump functions. 
but so 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 there was a study 30, 30 years ago. People were interested in it. So there's a lot of literature which Banner spaces have smooth bump functions and so on. But SC smooth bump functions are a little bit more there because it's a weaker requirement. So, but in any case, on Hilbert spaces where where I was set up, you don't have to worry. So, so here is my here is the set O, and here is sort of a neighborhood. So now just here, say this is a point which goes to the object alpha. Now you just construct with a bump function this object here. So, so you just take a bump function, which at this object corresponding to alpha uh, takes this value E0, which corresponds to the given thing in, the f in, in your fiber. You take the support in this small set, and then you rotate it around by the action. So you now you have a local thing. So, so this is now on the image of psi bar of k, so that then we, we, we define it by this formula, yeah, which is precisely the definition. And now we extend it to the whole category. Namely, if you have any vector, then if there is no, if there is no morphism which brings the underlying base point into the, into the image of O, you just say it's, it's the multi-section which has one on the zero section. And if you actually can reach this patch here, then you just define it by this, by what you reach. And that is a smooth functor. Because if I go from one to the other, I have this smooth transition. So if I have a local section structure here, I just can move it over there. Yeah? So, so that is a local construction. You know, so, so now you can take a finite number of those parameterized by P to fill up the co-kernel at alpha. Then the Freytown property actually guarantees that it nearby is also the case. You do this at different spots co covering the compact solution space. And then you have enough things to do precisely what Katrin says. Yeah? said some time ago, OK? So, and so now uh, I generously got five minutes, and I only use three of them. So I'll stop here. Otherwise, this. Ha. Ah. <laughs> Are there any questions for our speaker? Can you go back? Um, just yeah, to the last slide. Um, <laughs> no? <laughs> My computer is very entertaining. Okay. Um, can you go through this again and tell me again like which, which spaces are, are which in this picture? Okay. So, in this argument, actually, it wasn't so apparent. It's actually important that the underlying space is actually at least power compact. So. So I take a look at psi of O. Uh, it takes the uh, associated isomorphism class, which is sort of this red stuff. That's then the that is here. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So then, then in this isomorphism class is the uh, is the class of the original object alpha given, which, and I take a neighborhood around this. Okay. And then, then the thing is that. So this is a metrizable space, so it's normal. So I can actually find a small neighborhood around it that the closure in the whole space is still contained in it. That's important. Because otherwise, that thing will actually not become e even continuous. Yeah. So then, then you take the pre-image of U in O, which is this blue thing. So this red stuff is O, and this is a pre-image of this U. So now in this one, you take a bump function which has support in this. And here, here somewhere is... is a point which corresponds to the object alpha which lies here. Now, it's the object alpha, this is a category. It lies, there's the object alpha somewhere here. It comes from a point which lies in the blue region. So over the blue region, there's this point representing alpha, say Q0. And over this alpha, there was this fiber, there was the vector E, which corresponds to some vector lying over this Q0 in the bundle K. So now you just take a bump function, which is one in the neighborhood or at this point here, times this vector and extend it. So, so I haven't talked about extension results, but they are on the polyfold level quite easy. So you, you can ask me maybe on Friday and I can show you how to construct them there. So anyway, so there is, so there is a section with support in the blue thing. And now uh, you, you want to construct a functor. So what I do is I transport this section around by conjugation. So, and then I define, the, then, I, then I get as many, of course, some of, 
it could be if you have a symmetric section, then some of them are the same, yeah? but that doesn't matter. This is your, your index set, and you give each of them the weight one over the order of the group. One over the order. In this definition of F and G, suppose this Q0 that you had like had isotropy, like, I mean, you can still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is actually coming from the isotropy group of this element. Uh -huh. so, this is a, so if that has a large isotropy, then in general, I would, for example, construct something like, like this F, which achieves some transversality nearby, then since the bar is a functor, then if I conjugate the functor, it doesn't change. Yeah? But this then, so, so then the perturbation by this one is a conjugation of the perturbed thing by G, so it's also transversal, at least in the region by one. So, so, so moving this around doesn't destroy transversality. And then, of course, in general, you might see some other sections all from coming from the overlaps or so, yeah, at the point. But, but for the construction, that is sort of the minimalistic thing you have to do. And then you give each of them the weight one over the number of elements in the group. So that's precisely the requirement. So that means now on that slice, when you look what happens, so, so the section is now defined on that thin slice here. So now I have to extend it. So then get, I get an object here, here with some vector. If, if, there is a if there's no morphism from this one, which reaches a point which lies in here. <coughs> yeah, so if I cannot, if I, so if, if a, so if, so either I can reach this slice or not. If I can reach this slice by morphism, then I, if I cannot reach the slice, I put the weight on the zero section, one. And if I can reach this slice by, by morphism, then I define it like this. So I look at what, what point is there, and I take, give it the same value. And that is an SC plus section now defined globally. So, so it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not very difficult. It's just really always the local constructions. And, and uh, the, lang I mean, the language is sort of so high level that you basically always see everything on the nodes. So you don't have to go in complicated coordinates and, and say what it actually means, what you're doing. So, so that, make, that makes it, of course, you could, and it would be an equivalent theory. But, 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 uh, but the, the language level is much easier if you stay on, on that high level. In particular, since on that high level, every information is there, and there are abstract results who produce whatever you want. OK, so good. So I, I will ask a question that maybe I kind of know the answer, but I'm not sure. OK. Uh, so what is what exactly, what, what is the reason that we need to go to m polyfolds instead of working with retracts as our local model for this kind of category? Well, you, you can, you, you could put uh, retex there if you want. I mean, but you can, you can also put, M, you know. Uh, I mean, there are, there are, so this is a little bit larger. So this M polyphone is locally modeled on retract. So rather than taking just something which has one chart yeah, by retract, well, I then could replace this one shot by the actual retract. I do this. It also has some advantage when I do cover when I, when I discuss the coverings. So what is a local mo so so at some point of course in the whole thing which has been suppressed, I have to give a definition what is actually a covering functor, yeah, in the whole thing, and then I have to give a local model for this. Then on the top, you generally have more points, so it's actually more a union of retracts going down to the other thing. So it's e so the things are e easier, but. One, one, one could, but I think it would be unnecessarily restrictive to say that. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a fair question. I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, the equivalent would be in manifolds that I define a manifold as something which locally has charge isomorphic to an open set in Rn. And I just define this is a manifold with, because it's locally homeomorphic to some manifold, to some smooth manifold, with a transition smooth manifold. Yeah, so the manifold is like locally a manifold. I mean, <laughs> no, 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 no. Right, that's what this is. Also, one one side is a category, and the other is actually some well-defined smooth kind of object. Okay, I see just your brain, but thanks, I'm with you guys.